the last of these uh, fishbowl uh, tables. And uh, before we end this whole process, I just want to do one uh, embarrassing thing, and that is to say very specifically, uh, thank you, Jamie Galoon, for making sure that we got everywhere we needed to be. <laughs> that we were sitting where we needed to be sitting, and that we knew what we were doing when we got there. So thank you very much. All right. So this is the last of these tables, and we have, um, we've been listening uh, for the better part of a day and a half now uh, to this uh, conversation, and I just want to uh, encourage everyone on the listening circle to take their seats, and I'm going to call out Bill O'Brien because this is the NEA misbehaving uh, <laughs> on live stream. <laughs> I can do that. Bill, Bill knows too much about me. Um, so uh, thank you for everybody. Uh, so we're going to uh, very quickly go around. Uh, this, this table is all uh, folks who are in the part of this conversation that is about the presentation of the work. And so we're going to go around. We're going to do our uh, names. Uh, organizational affiliation, and then name a project that we're involved with, have been involved with, that uh, relates to the topic of these days. And for a couple of people here, there's not a project to be named, and that'll, that's part of the conversation that we'll be having, okay? So, uh, and as uh, we've done in the past, we'll do 45 minutes here at the table, and then we will move to the larger, and if, as you saw the last time, if some of the conversation hasn't surfaced fully here, we'll take it there. My goal is really, this is a huge area, and my goal is to get as many of the, the um, themes and uh, discussion topics on the table as possible so that when we move to the larger group, we're um, looking at as much of the field of practice as we can. Okay, so thank you for bearing with me on that. So let's go ahead and start this direction this time. Great. I'm Madeline Bell. I am at the Flynn Center for the Performing Arts in Burlington, Vermont. Um, and earlier this fall, we presented um, Axis Dance Company, and they did To Go Again, by uh, choreographed by Joe Good. Hi, I'm Ruth Walks. I'm the Funding Executive Director of the Moss Art Center at Virginia Tech. And uh, we did, in 1415, we did a series of performances which included Healing Wars in the spring of 2015. Hi, I'm Rob Richter from Connecticut College in New London, Connecticut, and we have not engaged in a project uh, in Great. this area. Great. I'm Colleen Jennings Rogensock, Executive Director of Arizona State University's GAMAGE, and of the many programs we've done, uh, Veterans uh, Holding It Down, a Veterans Dreams Project. Maurice DeKalb is actually here, and we worked with BJ Iyer. Great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael Reed from also ASU GAMAGE. Uh, I'm the Director of Programs. Um, carpet bag theater and speed uh, killed my cousin this fall. We presented in residency and performance. Great. I'm Carla Peterson. I'm director of the Maggie Allison National Center for Choreography, which is in Florida State University in the dance department. Um, but I also want to say I was for 25 years basically in presenting. In spite of that, I'm going to say I haven't been involved in a project like this. However, I inherited a really beautiful project, which was Liz Lerman's Healing Wars, and I came in on the uh, second of her, her second residency after three trips that she and her company made. Hi, I'm Ty Furman. I run the BU Arts Initiative out of the Office of the Provost at Boston University. And last spring, we um, had Theater Nogaku in residence. And as a piece of that, we presented an original new piece in the style of a Japanese no warrior play um, written uh, by one of our faculty members about her experience with her and her husband, who was a, a fighter pilot. So, Clyde Valentine, Ignite Arts Stylist at Southern Methodist University School of the Arts. And um, the project, it's, it's not a straight theater project or multidisciplinary project, but it's an initiative called Community Innovation Lab. One of our members, we have 40 different members uh, that are part of the lab. One of them is this organization called FARM, which is Farmers Assisting Returning Military. But within, um, that group, we have food producers, food policy people, artists, educators, um, and, and um, healthcare workers. 
So I just want to throw that level yeah. of intersectionality right. into we'll the room. back to that. I'm Margaret Lawrence, the Programming Director at the Hopkins Center at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, and we've done a number of these projects, but the one I'm hoping to talk about is one where we're trying to um, have an ongoing institutionalized partnership, so I'll just call it um, the Community Venture Initiative. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to start in the keeping with this earlier theme of vulnerability and the areas that we're not expert. Uh, I want to start with both Rob and Carla. What you've heard so far uh, in this conversation, what are the things that are resonating for you that draw you closer to wanting to engage the work, and what are the things that challenge you most deeply as you think about it? I'll start. Um, yeah, I've had a desire to do this, some of this work. I saw an early version of Bass Track and was very engaged and very interested. Um, I've I'm in a military community, a naval community, um, and, but I don't want to do a one-off. I want to have some continuity within the community. We're a small program. We d present a very diverse program, um, but it is me. It's me doing, you know, creating the engagement um, choosing the artists, picking them up at the hotel, um, so uh, developing the marketing plan. So, so that capacity to really engage that community and, and a variety of different communities in the way that I think it needs to be engaged and to have a, continue, a, a continuity. It's just not okay that we did this this year and then 10 years later we come around to doing something else. Um, that's to me, a disservice to the community, to the work, to you know, so many things. Um, but I'm finding ways, and even when I was asked, uh, when, when Jane contacted me to come, I said, well, you know, all right, in what capacity? <laughs> you know, I'm a presenter, I'm an advisor to the National Theater Project, I'm on the board of the Regional Cultural Coalition, and working with military communities in that way. Uh, uh, and, sh and she said, well, all. I said, okay, you know, just as long as I know how many hats to bring. And, um, and so I'm beginning to see ways through our cultural coalition and contacts. I mean, somebody else on the board is with the Office of Military Affairs. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm beginning to make those contacts. Okay. Um, and so it's, it's it's been great to hear of various projects and techniques and things, and also confirming for myself that the continuity is important. Okay, great. Carla? Yeah. Um, there's a couple of different reasons why I think I'm um, really interested somehow figuring out a way to engage in this work, although I don't know how. Because I'm not a presenter, I am someone who uh, supports the development of work. Um, but a couple of things. One is that um, I've been in the field for a long time. I've watched you know, history change politically, socially, culturally, et cetera, et cetera. But just in terms of being here now and what is happening in this country, and it's not the only good reason why one should engage with this, but it is, it is uh, and I know we're always talking about this, is not what we're doing here is not political, but it is political for me. And, um, and that is that uh, while this is going on, in addition to making your phone calls, being around to, to your congressperson, what is it that you can do in the field in which you work in terms of, uh, in terms of art and the making of art and bringing art and audiences somehow or another together in meaningful ways? This seems like an absolute, absolute necessity to, to get in, uh, connected to. And also because being in the field for a long time, I've, you know, it's a gift to work in this field, and I have had such an opportunity to engage in so many different kinds of things. But not this, I've never been in a room like this. I, I know, we're not supposed to yeah. that, and I did it again. <laughs> but I've never, ever been in a room like this. And I'm trying to kind of rack my brains if I ever actually sat and had a meaningful conversation with a vet. I don't think I have. Mm -hmm. And Thank that's, you. I'm not saying that proudly, I'm just saying mm -hmm. it's not been part of my universe. And it seems that it is now, that is the thing that I need to do. In terms of, 
in terms of how to do it, uh, again, I'm not a presenter. I completely got to underscore what you're just saying in terms of the things that I've been hearing and also knowing other kinds of sort of community engagement kind of work. It really is a very time. The capacity is about time. It's about building trust. You cannot just go in and out. And how to do that while still maintaining the work that I'm supposed to be, doing, you know, the reason why I got hired, uh, supposedly, you know, for the position that I'm running. So, so it has to do with that. But I also want to say that maybe there's a way of kind of flipping that, and that is I do have a resource, um, and that I think in the way that Jennifer Callian is my um, predecessor, worked with Liz Lerman in identifying how to bring members of the community and vets into and, and other and family members into the process and having Liz come for a site visit and she can talk about all of this of course much in much more detail and more accurately than I can. But then having two more residencies so there was real time to be, you know, in that community for a while as opposed to somebody coming in and out. And that is something I think I can do. Great. Kai, did you have a response to that? Well, I, I wanted to uh, answer that question, too, because, you know, we, um, we're a young center. We're mm -hmm. two years old, and we don't have a, a long history of presenting, right? And I, I think when I came in, I had a series of themes that I wanted to um, tackle, mm -hmm. um, food being one of them, which is why this project is, is coming to fruition. You know, the military was not one of them. Um, and... Uh, I think that was for a lot of reasons. You know, we touched upon some of those earlier today, uh, the conflicting nature of even, you know, our anthem. And um, at the same time that we began to relocate uh, to Dallas, Texas, you know, um, the closest I have to a son, who's my uh, young brother-in-law, we helped to raise him, um, you know, instead of going to college, he decided he was gonna enlist in the military. And we became a military family. We uh, were at his first leave when he was in training camp uh, for Thanksgiving and had a Thanksgiving dinner. We flew the family down for uh, graduation from training camp. Uh, we made sure we attended his reenlistment ceremony. Um, so we are invested because he is our son, mm -hmm. our brother, and we love him and we want him to know he's not alone mm -hmm. in the decision he made. So it's deeply personal mm -hmm. to me. Um, and so I'm grateful to be in the space, but it's the way I know how to make work, it, it is not a one-off to your point, right? Uh, so I'm here listening and learning and thinking deeply about what that sustained engagement looks like, because that's the only way I know how to make a commitment. Yeah, great. Uh, can I ask you, uh, Colleen or Michael, both of you, to, to comment? <clears throat> One of the, um, I'm sorry, Ruth, we'll come back to this. I, I wanted to uh, just pull a little bit. What are the core competencies? You guys have a very long history over many projects in, in this work. What are the core competencies that you have had to develop, both personally and on, in your staff, to be able to create the kinds of authenticity in the work that, that Rob and Carla are talking about being a, a first hurdle? What are, what are some of those well, elements of competency? I think one of the things that goes back to um, the organization's 52 years old. I've been its executive director for 24 of those 52 years. Over that time, the staff collectively discussed and developed our mission. Mm -hmm. Our mission is connecting communities. And then we identified those missions, those communities, and stayed true to them. I'm a military brat. Of course the military was going to be one of those. We live in a state where there are many military bases, National Guard, Air Force, et cetera. But the core competency was understanding the work that we do is connected back to a community, that those communities are not monolithic, so they must connect to a multiplicity of communities. So we are connected to the Latino communities, we are connected to the African American communities, we are connected to Jewish communities. All those communities are represented in the military. Mm -hmm. So that was important. The other thing that was really critical is return on investment. We had to redefine what that means. We are a large organization, we are a $19 million organization. We get no support from the university or the state. We make it, we raise it, we earn it. 
So then we had to say, what is the return on investment in doing this work? Mm -hmm. And I think it was stated earlier, it's not the return on investment isn't dollars or, or um, having butts and seats. I hate to be crude, butts and seats. But it is about creating partnerships, sustaining partnerships. It is about addressing issues that have um, concern over a broad group of communities. Those are our return on investments that we look at. So we don't look at the dollars, we don't look at this. We do have to look at how we pay for it. And so in those partnerships, and it's something um, Annie actually, Anne just uh, brought up about, you know, what are those guys of going to? We found that we had partners in the military. The US Army Foundation supports our work, as do the Blue Star Moms. Senator John McCain and Cindy McCain, Mrs. McCain, are not only active supporters of our work, they financially support our work. We found the Arizona Lottery, we are the only cultural organization that they have given multiple years of funding to for this work in particular. So you can develop partnerships. We went out, I went out to Luke Air Force Base to meet with the general and just talk about what we hope to do over a long period of time. You know, and, and like with any partners, there was skepticism, but we just kept doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask Michael, would he like to add something? Core competencies. So I've been in the organization 22 years uh, from a very structured background in the arts as a classical ballet dancer. So what I've seen that has been successful over the years is the consistency, is also in the case of, I'll go directly to Speed Kill My Cousin and Carpet Bag, we had already done, two years prior, military-based theater projects or multimedia projects with bass track and uh, holding it down. But we'd also had, for at least 15 years, really solid, ongoing programs to support military families to come to our theater. So not at all the same type of interaction with military, but very important mm -hmm. relationships that were already there. So a, a real trust. What kind of programs, Michael? Could you describe the programs in a little so, bit of detail? Um, this is an interesting one. About 10 years ago, we started from the Broadway League. They started a program that they funded in the beginning across the country. That's the League of Broadway Producers. It's like a professional association of, of theaters and producers of Broadway work. Mm -hmm. um, and it was Family First Nights was the name of the program. Mm -hmm. We were the only um, partner that decided we're calling it military family first nights. So we focused on all those military partnerships that Colleen had spoken of with Luke and, and others, uh, Arizona Army Na National Guard is another really one, important one. And that's who we came upon, the National Guard, because those families were not trained to be Marines. They were trained to help in national disasters or floods, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they're doing three tours of duty in Iraq. So. Those families, we felt um, there was a structure in place. We had a good partnership from them coming to other shows on an ongoing basis. Um, so that was one of the first ongoing programs, still going. We've had a probably 20 year program with Vet Ticks. So Vet Ticks is a national organization that very well, in a very organized way, uh, gives tickets to, to veterans and veterans' families. So calling on those, partnerships, when I was in early, early conversations with Linda and some of our campus partners like the Tillman Center, the mm -hmm. Pat Tillman Center on campus, were key because knowing what you don't know, you know, even though we had done these other military themed projects, Carpetbag was interested in having very real interaction with PTSD vets and I knew that okay, I need to go talk to some of these vets on campus and see what their take was, and do they want to be involved in this or not? Do they want to see a theater piece like this or not? So I did that listening tour, talked with our partners, early conversations with Linda and Andrea. All of that helped us form the, the, the most um, respectful uh, and impactful approach to creating the residency. Okay, yeah, great, thank you. Uh, Margaret? So we've done several of these large projects and um, actually out of an older um, three-year programming initiative that was part of um, Creative Campus called Class Divide, we had developed um, an ongoing relationship with 
um, military in a more institutional way. So we've really been trying to grow that and now through, I guess, another version of that initiative um, that we hope will be permanent. Um, we, you know, we're in a really small rural community. Our town is 10,000 people. Um, we're surrounded by just very small villages, so we don't have most of those large organizations. What we do have is the VA, and then we have a very small undergraduate um, veterans association on campus, maybe like 25 students. So um, our relationship is primarily with the VA, and um, this is a way to make us more accessible to them. And I, I guess the competencies would really mostly be um, kind of learning points for us about that way of working. Um, rather than, um, and I'm not, I don't mean that what you guard, I don't think this is what anybody's mentioned so far, but sometimes organizations um, provide tickets to things that they know are not gonna, you know, mm -hmm. kind of the dogs, right? So nobody has here has said that, but. Um, but rather than do that, we actually establish a bank account for the VA that they can spend on anything. They can spend it on Yo-Yo Ma, they can spend it on anything. And we work with them at the beginning of the year to do that. What we've really learned um, by partnering with them is that, um, I guess several points. One is, obviously has been said before, the, the veterans are not monolithic at all all. Um, many have traveled internationally, some have never been anywhere, some have never been on a plane, some, many have never been on a campus. So it's really to take that risk of coming outside their comfort um, level. Um, the VA is very bureaucratic and things that seem like a priority to us may be superseded by much more important priorities for them. So it really does take patience and um, for us to understand that process. Um, some of our biggest um, successes have been moments when we have something that we can bring to them physically, something like Combat Paper Project, where people can actually get their hands on something, mm -hmm. have some result that they can point to that comes out of it. Um, they especially like when there's moments of very clear instructions. So the recording at the beginning of the show about what to do, the veterans love it because it's clear. It's like, here's the instructions. And then something that I was um, talking about earlier, um, that's a challenge maybe we can come back to is that um, they do not see this as a charity and um, having dedicated a career to service, um, they really are now starting to ask what, how they can give back to us and we're challenged by this because we've never been asked that before. So it's very interesting. Yeah, um, and, I, and I was gonna follow up similar I think to, to what Clyde was saying is I, um, we're a fairly new presenting organization. We opened in the fall of 2013, and we actually are just establishing um, some consistency in, in developing work around veterans, around mili those in the military service. Virginia Tech has a, um, a military um, history and background. We have a Corps of Cadets on our campus. There are 1,000 students who are in our Corps. About 75% of those will go on to active, active duty service. Um, so, you know, that, that's an element there. Um, when I think about um, Liz Lerman and the Healing Wars, actually Liz first came to our campus before our new art center was open. And it was really in the context of science and research because we have a phenomenal, uh, the Virginia Tech Carilion Research Institute. So we have these amazing uh, brain researchers. And so that was our initial conversation. And the reason we brought, brought Liz in was to meet with the, the faculty and the researchers there. Um, and I think that, that one of the keys, in the, and then of course it grew and developed. We have an amazing Center for Civil War Studies. Uh, you know, we've got the core, we've got this military history. So we found a lot of different layers. But as I have been sitting here now for two days trying to figure out what is our intention? What is our motivation if we're gonna pursue this? I don't think it can be just singularly, we want to be working in specifically with, with veterans or in the military service. I think it needs to intersect with these other areas. And it might be with the health sciences, it might be with creative technologies and different mm -hmm. ways that artists are working to um, bring this, this kind of work forward. But as I'm trying to sort of process all of this here, I think that's gonna be essential for our university. We can't afford, because of the capacity issues, we can't afford to have one staff person who's really focused on this for three years and just this. We've got community engagement happening on a lot of different levels. Mm -hmm. And we need to pay attention to those different levels. Yeah, I, I want to pick up on the knowing what you don't know and ask you to go a little bit further. Uh, first of all, how do you know what you don't know? And then if you, if you have an idea about that, what do you, what do you need 
what gaps are there in your capacity to actually pursue this fully? Can you identify just uh, some, like as you look at it, what would be your gaps at this point? Mm. I'm gonna come to you guys yeah. about that. Well, as I said, I think we need to seriously, we meaning myself, my staff, uh, ourselves as a presenting organization, what, what are we trying to accomplish with this? And that's another part of this whole conversation is, who is the audience? There are, there are those who participate, and we had some outstanding st uh, student veterans who also participated with Liz in interviews. I mean, just compelling evening that we all spent together. Um, you know, that's one aspect, but there's this larger audience, and, and with both Healing Wars, and we also presented Bass Track and had some really great engagement around that. And again, as we've heard, the audiences, however, the sort of general public coming into this work, it was, it was much more difficult. And where did those engagements take place with uh, Bass Track? Were they as part of the performances, or were they uh, on the way uh, leading uh, up to the performances? We did a workshop the night before a performance so with a group who signed up. During the period yeah, of residency yes. that included mm -hmm, the performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were doing some advanced work with, uh, we have a terrific group of faculty who work on a Veterans in Society conference, you know, so we just have all these sort of elements and people we connected with. Um, so I felt like there was a small group that was very engaged in all of these projects and benefited. But then there was that larger public, you know, and it's the same public, I have to say, who go to the football game and it's Veterans Appreciation Game Day and we've got the, you know, the camouflage jerseys on and everybody's hoorah. But they won't come to see a theater piece that's about the Marines' experience, or they won't come and see something historical. You know, and, and I think it's one of the things that, you know, you asked about core competencies, David. A lot of those we learned on the way, and then where we hit a wall and felt like we were in territory we didn't know, we actually went to the Pat Tillman Center, and we, we hired one of their best people away to come and work with us on this, but on other things as and well. And the Pat Tillman Center is? Is the Veterans Center at Arizona State University. We have the lar largest ROTC in the country. Mm -hmm. We were ranked the number one most military friendly. And then it's a center for returning vets. Mm -hmm. And it's such an important center that we are um, actually involved in moving the center to, we're redoing our state, we're putting $300 million into the football stadium. But in that process, we're gonna turn it into a 365 day a year facility. And we wanted the vets to be up front and center. We're gonna have playgrounds so their families could come and that's their welcome to the university as opposed to trying to find their way in that large city we're in. But the other thing I wanted to say is that we looked at those kinds of partners who go to football games. And actually our athletic director, Ray Anderson, who's amazing, I absolutely love him. We sat down one day and we were talking and he said, you know, I wanna have something called a senior experience. And I wanna have every athlete who's a senior, and we have like thousands of them, <laughs> graduate, not graduate without having a strong cultural experience. And so as we talked about that, we said, well, what should their first experience be? And it was Black Angels over Tuskegee. And it was the story of the um, Tuskegee Airmen. And he said, because it's about leadership, it's about gutting it out, it's about teamwork, it's about all of these things. One of the things that was interesting, the captain of the basketball team stood up, the women's basketball team, and said, she's an African-American young woman. I don't know who the Tuskegee Airmen were. I'd never been in the theater before. This was the most important experience of my mm. four years here. Mm -hmm. And so we knew that that's a group to engage. Because yes, they're there for veterans. So how do we get them into the theater? And now we're actually gonna bring through Pat Tillman the work to them in the stadium. As you, Ty uh, and Madeline, as you look at your own interest in the work and your own history with the work, what are the gaps for you that you see um, that you've heard about today that there may be uh, that might be resonating for you about ways to fill them. What, what struggles do you have? What challenges do you have? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I um, think I'm, I've been looking around, and one thing I realized is we're the only standalone presenter, not based at an um, institute of higher education. And um, I think that has been a little bit of a gap in capacity for us, most definitely. Um, I uh, think we've had to engage uh, the university in different ways. We actually did um, Black Angels over Tuskegee as well. And the way that came to us was not through veterans and the military community, but through um, multicultural affairs and, um, and uh, diversity. 
um, at, the, at the University of Vermont at UVM. Um, and so that was a way that we were able to then um, invite the um, Vermont National Guard and their families uh, two black angels, and so we, we sort of got that multiplicity. We got the multiplicity with the veteran community, the military community, the, um, the UVM students and professors, and um, connected, connected it to curriculum. Um, so we're, we're making up for those gaps in capacity by, by <laughs> coming in from a different angle. Um, I think also we've talked a lot about um, process versus product, and and it's hard for a lot of us here, I think, to think of we're 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 trained to think about product, about um, the end show and the end number of tickets you're selling, um, and so really trying to, from an internal standpoint, change that in our own organizations, focusing on process the artwork or, or letting other people in your organization know and um, that the process is also the product. Um, I, I think for me is a, a gap that we're trying to fill, uh, definitely. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things I want to acknowledge, sort of similar to what, what our differences is, I am not a presenting center. I'm an academic unit, unit as part of the Office of the Provost. So I don't have to fill a season. Mm -hmm. I get to do one really big project mm -hmm. um, as best we can with the resources that we have, and I don't have to sell tickets. Um, so the va vast majority of what, you, right, so I know, I know, I have a lot of freedom that way. <laughs> Part of what that has, has done is obviously given us a lot of freedom in what we've done, um, doing things free and open to the public and partnering, but um, there are so few, so I do one a semester, that I am trying to meet the needs of faculty across the university. So. Um, we had a fantastic experience um, through NIFA and, and, and Margaret um, with the Now Project three years ago, but we can't justify bringing them back because I have to move on to do dance or film or yeah. You know, so, so this is this is so like the time to develop the relationships. Well, not only that, but but the continuity. It's you yeah. know as we're saying and we're hearing all the time here. It's not a one-off. It's not a hit and run kind of thing, uh, and yet in the course of our work, there are choices that have to be made about how many different touches there are, um, and that's a that's a, a trade-off that we're talking about. I, I uh, have another uh, question, and maybe this has come up in your work, um, or maybe it hasn't yet, but uh, in terms of uh, some of the stuff that you've heard in the room, uh, you know, the last couple of days about uh, the risks of uh, the risks around trauma, the the sense of uh, the cultural differences, the the uh, all of those uh, risks that we've identified, in particular, uh, and I will hear from you guys. Really, let's hear some of the the learnings that you've had as well. Uh, how are you currently positioned to take responsibility for those risks, and and what are your what's your sense of competence there? Who's got? Yeah, you want to. Can I in? just? Yeah. Jump in in terms of, you know, something I've been thinking about in terms of the cultural differences, and, and we're not dealing with the risk of, you know, for our audiences yet, but they, I mean, across the street from us is the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, and I would love to have the cadets come. And early on, we had a performance, I think it was, you know, uh, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan early in my years there, and two cadets came to the box office and, <laughs> and they didn't have enough cash with them or something like that. And I chased them and I said, no, no, come in, I'll let you in, I'll give you free tickets. I have the capacity to give you free tickets, <laughs> you know, and, you know, and they, they, they wouldn't do it. And I think it was a cultural thing. Um, and, you know, we are the liberal, you know, liberal arts college, you know, on the hill. And, you know, when we were an all-women's college, there was a lot more mixing between the cadets and the women. Uh, <laughs> but that doesn't happen anymore. And so there is that, there is that cultural barrier. Um, and, you know, along, I mean, and the, my other experience with the military community coming to our events was, this was one of my first years at the college, and we had... Um, the Eroica Trio, Piano Trio, Classical, great musicians, beautiful women with great photographs. Our audience was more than 50% single men from 
the submarine base. Uh, but, yeah. and so... Let me ask you, Robert. So these, these cultural differences, and I want to get deeper and like... You know, but, no, but, but I'll, take it, I'll take it a little bit. I'll take it one more step then with you. What, why does it matter if they come to your theater? To me, it matters because they're an important part of our community. Mm -hmm. they, are, they, are, they are part of our community. And this, is, this is actually also gets at some time in my hesitation. Um, because am I just wanting to do this because this is au courant or, you know, it, and, you know, these are, you know, and, and I don't, no, that isn't for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, my choice for drama or comedy, I go to drama. I've done a lot of work in the prison systems and working with uh, female inmates and, and male inmates. And, tr and they, wanted, they wanted to do the heavy drama that I wanted to do. And so these, these are stories that are, that are part of our community. And I want to expose our student community Mm -hmm. to this community. I want to diversify their experience. Um, and that's, that's just part of me. I mean, I've always okay. been... Um, yep. uh, what, what I was going to say with it, you're kind of touching on is um, kind of the approach for some of this material that can be sensitive. And, and I, f I, again, I see this on the same spectrum and trajectory as work that we're doing with non-veteran communities. And you mm -hmm. and I were just together in an international mm -hmm. theater project where as a campus-based presenter, I'm still meeting with students who have feelings about some possible triggers with some very challenging theater work we did in January. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't see these as all that different in terms of um, the care and the time and the thought that needs to go into not just telling somebody about what we think they might want to come to and trying to take care of them in terms of triggers they might have, but helping them understand what we have and then allowing them to choose what they may want to see. And one of the big revelations for my educational staff with the VA was that they didn't just want to come see reentry, although they did, but they didn't just want to. They wanted to see African drumming because they had never seen it. They wanted, some of them had traveled in Europe and really wanted to see classical music. So again, like getting away from this monolithic, but also remembering the, the time and the thought that needs to go into helping people understand what it is that we're inviting them to. A little follow-up on that because one of the things Michael alluded to the other programs we do in addition to military family night we do operation date night and we do heroes night so with heroes night we honored the World War II veterans the code talkers we honored um, the dog that found bin Laden the um, MWD servicemen and women who work with military working dogs and we we say there are things that you we have a rule and it's a three question rule okay what do you want what do I want and what do we want together? Mm -hmm. And so whether it's with our veterans partners, our artists, our any other communities we work with, we say, what do you want? What do I want? And then what do we want together? And we work on that sweet spot. And some of the things are mutually together and some of the things are, are different. And just as, yes, they loved coming to see Maurice DeKalb and BJ Iyer in the Holding It Down, but they also, loved coming to see White Christmas. Mm -hmm. It was a big night. Mm -hmm. we, had, we had 300 families there. Mm -hmm. And it was a Broadway show and it was a big ticket item. You know, so, so it is about not t treating the group monolithic. It is about the notion of communities and it is about cross communities and mm -hmm. making sure there is um, integration. Mm -hmm. We've heard a lot about um, kind of the, uh, there's been a kind of a sense of care, careful, being careful. Um, about the work, about the, the audiences, about the veterans that you're in, inviting into process. And, and how, how are you careful? And, and how are you um, uh, not, <laughs> in a way? Like, how, how far is that over the overboard for you? Or what, what's your sense of that? This is, uh, this is a good segue into what we were just talking about, what Margaret and Colleen were talking about. So 18 years ago, we started a program in the Estrella Jail for Women. Mm -hmm. and it's still going, with local artists, with Pat Graney, 
It was mm -hmm. called Keeping the Faith then, and now it's been Journey Home for 17 years. That was the first step for me in the organization where I knew I was way out of my depth as far as what do I know about this culture? Yeah. Zilch. So let me talk to people who really do. Let me work with an artist who really does, Pat. Um, and let's find artists that have the capabilities and are passionate. So that happened, luckily, through Pat's great guidance and f coming across the right personnel at Estrella, which is, by the way, is a Sheriff Joe Arpaio, Joe. At the it's time. a what? He's no longer our sheriff. Sheriff Joe Arpaio, ah. who was very infamous. Sheriff Joe's Joe. At okay. the time, yeah. So Pat wanted absolutely to be in one of his facilities. And we, <laughs> we, found, we found the right person to do it. So the point is, that was this jumping off point for one to know to be really smart about their approach. Careful is another word for it. But uh, we also did a piece with John B, a, co a company from Senegal, a dance company, about R R Rwanda genocide. And we have Rwandan um, refugees in, in West Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And they became a part of that whole residency carefully. So I think really it's having the advanced conversations, letting the artists lead you, like Linda and Carpetbag led us on what mm -hmm. they wanted to do because I, they had the experience doing it. And we had people on campus who had the experience working with PTSD veterans. So I guess it's going on a, on a investigating tour early, finding out what your community and your constituents from those particular communities, if it's a really sensitive situation, what those many different opinions are and how to approach respecting all those opinions while still programming residency that's impactful. So that, that can be tricky and it's never perfect, that, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, it w I have a couple more themes I want to get out before we uh, break off the table. Uh, one, uh, Margaret, you raised it, um, but anybody, please jump in. You talked about uh, your interest in this work as something that has a, a kind of a different dimension uh, for measuring quality or measuring, you know, you have a different expectation of it. Um, and someone else had, had said earlier that it needs, that, that the art needs to be valid as art as well as valid at, in service of whatever the, the goal was in this work. And I, I wondered how you all are feeling. I'm sure there's a range of opinions. I don't want, a, I don't want there to be a, a consensus. I hope there's not to be a, just a yes or no question. But, but this question of when you're doing this particular work, not just any work, but this particular work, um, are, what are the goals of art qua art, and what are the goals of, of impact, and which is leading, or are they, are they in the sort of Liz, wow, Liz, we're really pulling on you today, <laughs> all day, <laughs> in, that, in that image that she gave us. So, uh, let's talk about quality. I love our Carla's face. Make Carla talk. Carla. Make Carla talk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I'll, get you. I'll get you there for sure. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, Carla. It was written on your That's face. That's a really hard one. No, yeah. that, is, that is something that we have to grapple. I mean, as presenters, we have to grapple with all the time. And if we're not grappling with it and we're not bringing people into the conversation with us that are challenging how we are making our kind of decision, you know, about what's quality and what's not, then there is, there is no, I, I would just say, sort of, you know, personal and professional growth in terms of how we are serving whatever it is that we're serving based on our, uh, on our mission. So it, I'm not trying to get around the, <laughs> around the question, but it's a question that I still find a difficult one. Is quality a fixed point for you? Uh, no, does it change no, based on no, no, the no, forms no, or no, by, based no. on it's, the projects? No, it's, all, it's, in, it's within context of what quality what is in context. the project is. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and who's and, and defining what the goal, it for you? What the goals are, what the aims are, and okay. where, where, what the journey is going to be, and what's happening along the journey. And, um, and in your, uh, coming again to the people who have uh, experience in this with um, artists working in this field and with uh, communities in, in this uh, field, uh, are you finding uh, that, are you, What's the conversation about quality there, well, both with the artists and then also with it, the community? I feel very strongly that we present quality art. 
mm -hmm. doesn't go on our stages unless it is. Mm -hmm. And I feel very strongly about the artists that we worked in this process are exquisite artists, artists that we would dedicate time and resources to, artists that often maybe don't have the resources they need and we try to figure out a way to give them more resources so that you see it's, it's never important for us to have the premiere. We like what we did with Bass Track. We could have, you just come here and you spend as much time as you need to get it right. And that's important to us. But this is art. And I am very, very, I am serious about this. Mm -hmm. And how do you know when I, it's art? Heart, head, gut. Thank you. Okay. I, I sort of start by approaching something, uh, again, because I, we're educational first. Um, from sort of the three legs of a, of a higher ed stool, you, um, which is teaching research and service to the community. Um, and we've had projects that I have not always felt were exceptional, but there was a lot of learning that happened. And again, I have that privilege of not worrying about selling the seats, but still worrying about filling the house. So I don't need the money, but I want people to experience it. Um, so it's a hard line, I think, for me. I think, you know, the, the one that I mentioned, which was um, English language, no theater. Um, we presented one traditional piece in English and then one newly developed piece in the style of, and we had no clue how that was going to go. Um, thankfully, it was received really well. In particular, it was received really well from the academic community to say this is, this is a place we should be exploring. And why were you, why were you exploring there? Um, one of the ways that I bring projects in is because a faculty bring it to me. And that was essentially mm -hmm. what happened. I had a faculty member who said, oh, I saw what you did with the Nile project. We right like that you. model. I have this company I'd like you to work with. And the company is international and well-respected and had a reputation, <clears throat> but it's not, um, you know, not a reputation necessarily of the touring circuit that you would find at APAP. Okay. Um, kind of yeah, you, you have a... Really quickly, I know we're going to get into a bigger conversation. I'm really hoping Chris Dwyer is still here because I know she's working on something that relates to aesthetics. That's all. You're nodding. I can see her. I'm in the not looking. Nodding. I'm not supposed to look. Okay. There's nobody and, out there. And then the uh, the uh, earlier comment that came up, and anybody take this, please, about our tendency to run towards the trauma, run toward the drama, run toward the the fix it as. Uh, so that was described as something that artists are drawn to. And let's remember that we're delegates from a much larger field of practice. Uh, we're not talking only about ourselves or to ourselves. But uh, how, what's your response as a presenter to that, that, that prompt? That was a, that's a provocative statement um, echoed a couple of times. And if I'm, I'm catching, I, I love the, the idea, the statement earlier that um, those who are veterans have this advantage on understanding the human condition. And I think when I think about us doing this work and my desire to bring those parts of our community who don't have any connection to veterans or to the military service, to bring that audience in so they can get a glimpse and understand more fully, that's what I really want. Um, yes, to have veterans in the audience is great, to have our Corps cadets, but it's, it's the great wash of people out there who are not connected to this. So, I mean, I loved flipping it that way and thinking that these are people who are actually advantaged in our community. In the same way we approach, um, you know, international artists and those who have different kinds of global connections or different diversity um, understanding that they bring to the table, I think it's the same thing. So I, I love that flipping of the idea. Yeah, I think it's um, recognizing and appreciating multiple forms of value in terms of what people bring to the table, you know, so the way vets have a certain perspective that we can all learn from, uh, that could be true for someone from Southern Dallas, you know, who's in a food desert, who uh, was born and raised in the city and had, knows the transportation system better than someone of a different sort of privilege, right? So I think part of what we try to do is foster uh, spaces where that learning can happen, that mutuality can happen. Um, and, you know, to the trauma question or what we kind of lean towards, you know, for me it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's got to be a combination of things. So I think it's always, a, you know, can we strike a balance? You know, it's good to be able to empathize and it's also great to uh, feel joy. I love that 
uh, quote from, you know, uh, the, the reentry piece, you know, the difference between happiness and joy mm -hmm. and being joyful. Uh, so I, I think we try to introduce that to the spaces and the moments that we help create as well. And uh, Susan Fader asked a question earlier that I want you guys to um, just respond to and then we'll break. Uh, but it was a question about what's needed. And I'm trying to get at that a little bit here as to what, from your perspective, you, you guys are kind of stewards of the infrastructure that a lot of this is relying on. Um, and we hear uh, it needs to be over time, it need, can't be a one-off, our staff is thin, we're focused on the engagement. What are some things that if you could wave a wand, you would fix? And, and money is money's a, maybe a mechanism, but what is it fixing if it's money? Um, what, are, what are just some, a couple of things, they don't have to be, you know, deeply thought through, but just on the top of mind, what is it that, it, that is needed? What's missing? Just really qu quickly, we were talking about the value of those intermediaries, the people like art. And um, I think if I could have, you know, like six mentorship sessions with somebody like that who would zoom into my community, help me think things through, maybe accompany me to some meetings that they could broker that I couldn't myself over several years, maybe not six a year, maybe there's three a year, but like where there's a trajectory where there's a maybe a three year commitment where I get that with a clear goal coming from me about where I want to go from where I am right now. Yeah, interesting. I mean, and it, it's just building on that. I mean, it's sort of a, a cultural intermediary. I mean, it's a, I'm entering in a world that I'm not familiar with, you know, and I'm not familiar with my Latino community. And, I, you know, and it's that same somebody who has that cultural, Competency, yeah, thanks. I mean, that's Madison had that uh, that contribution about the lexicon. Did that strike you as, as something that you would like to have access to the, and, and continue to build out? Yeah, other things like that. that I mean, sort of tagging onto that, I just feel like it would be great to have kind of uh, multiple uh, kinds of discourses that are occurring around a particular project. So that could be that could be you know, verbal, there could be panels, there could be, I mean, that's kind of standard things, but also articulation in writing, things that start to get out in multiple places as opposed to the focus entirely in that one space. Mm -hmm. And David, I would like to take it deeper. I think that those of us associated with the academy, our students in fine arts departments and art and institute and design departments are learning how to do, take our places, but they're not learning the depth of what it's going to take and learning how to do these kinds of things. And I would like to see a different kind of learning process happen there. For whom? For the young people who are going to graduate, come out, become presenters. Presenters, okay, people world. headed into this Specifically part of the into this work. part of the field to really learn. And so it becomes a part of their core curriculum and they get it and they understand it and we will have less on the job training right. that all of us went through. I think um, one of the things I appreciate about working on Now Project was the time and the effort that was given to us sharing resources throughout New England about, you know, how, what are you doing for educational? What experts are you bringing in? And so, um, I mean, it would be wonderful if we had that opportunity to do something like that for every project that we do. Because um, I know it's not the case. <laughs> Great, and Clyde, take your comment and let's let's move out and and you keep going with your comment. Let's move back. Yeah, out so and pull other um, people in. you know, uh, a toolkit maybe on methods of collaboration, several case studies of things that work and don't work, so you don't repeat the same mistakes that others have made. I know we've done that with our students. We've started a fellowship program. We're introducing a minor into our curriculum around engagement so that they can do that work while they're still undergraduates. Um, but you know, being in Dallas, a lot of this is like brand new for people. Uh -huh. You know, our large institutions and our local philanthropic base, and it's hard, there's a whole lot of education. And I'm like one person. Yeah, okay. So uh, the outer circle, what are you hearing that you wanna pick up on? What, uh, what offers do you wanna make to the this particular part of the conversation, anybody have a, a 
Yes, hi. Gonna, yes, there we go. Hi, um, Adrian Jefferson, Connecticut Office of the Arts. Um, but I'm actually going to come at this from a perspective of the work I used to do. So I used to be the executive director of the Writers Block Inc., which ignites social change on the page and the stage for young people, primarily young people of color, ages 10 through 17. And what they would do is choose subjects and topics that they felt were relevant to them about social change issues that they wanted to put on the stage. Never did I ever hear them talk about military, mm -hmm. veterans, um, or PTS. They don't know about that. So there is a disconnect. And it's interesting to me that, um, so I wrote some notes down, but it's interesting to me that there is a disconnect. But there is, and um, the reason is because in certain black communities, you're taught that the military is bad. And it's bad because you're already underrepresented in America. So why would I go fight? a war or why would I go do service when America is not doing justice or service to me? And so this is the mentality of some black communities. Um, but what I think would be interested, interesting, because um, I'm still on the board of directors and I still, for the writer's block and I still work with these kids, is to maybe push them in the direction of looking at it from commonality. So you think about Chicago, right, Chirac. They call it Chirac because they compare it to the things that are going on in Iraq with the daily deaths um, of young black men. You think about even um, reform. When you go into um, prisons and you come out, they wanna, they wanna go back in. That compares to people who come from Iraq or, or war and they, and they wanna go back. So there's something there, there's some kind of connection that I just wanted to bring to this group to have us think about that. So when we're, when we're talking about engagement or arts presenting, how can we connect to young people to get them to understand the issues, but also understand there's not much of a difference. Yeah, good. Uh, Marty, you have the, a mic over there. Um, <laughs> this is so extraordinary. Uh, it, it tired me out, which is hard to do. Um, <laughs> But it's so extraordinary, and I thought two quick things and then what I was gonna say, but just I wanted to thank everybody um, for this gathering, for what everyone's done, but also for you and Carl and everyone who's organized it. Um, it helps, obviously, to choose a deeply meaningful uh, uh, area to start yeah. with. But I hope this is some sign of what we as a community are building capacity to do with our time because we're sure gonna need it. Mm -hmm. um, I realized all these parallels between this production, the show I did called City Water, Water Tunnel Number 3, um, years ago between reaching out to the Sandhog, the miners community, yeah. and the Department of Environmental Protection Workers in New York City's uh, city municipal force and talk about a very structured, disengaged, you know, uh, from, they didn't, there was no way they were coming to DTW for, you know, let me list Dance the ways. Dance Theater Workshop for those Thank of you, you who Dance don't know Theater DTW. Workshop in Chelsea, in New York City, you know, off, whatever. So I, I knew early on, I mean, the show was in large part for them, and so how do I do that? And so I got, and, and, and without really a lot of support at the top, I mean, you, you can't convince municipal bosses to give their workers time. So whatever's gonna happen is going to be on the lunch break, um, uh, and the same with the construction people. Um, you know, you're just not gonna get it. And so that was in the hog house you know, when they were above ground before they went down. It's a trailer on site. So I went around to the sites and did tiny excerpts um, and let that be its own thing, which a lot of the groups who've been showing their work have figured out to do. And then in the lunch hour in the DEP, you know, you've got like 300 people eating lunch. How do you figure that out? But um, a bad effort is better than no effort. Um, or a failed effort. And then we designed a, a, a video with the help of Mary Ellen Strom, a video because these workers had, had worked their entire lives designing the tunnel and being secretaries and engineers and civic engineers and um, assistants, and they'd never been there. And so we took this incredible footage of the tunnel and built um, a, a thing you looked through, positioned it very strategically where they were out of sight of the boss, the boss's offices, and designed this wonderful thing with Tony Giovanetti's help, where you started it and stopped it. It only ran if you put your hand on a cut out of a hand, and it stopped instantly. So that if someone showed up down the hall that you knew, what are you doing looking at a video right at work? 
But then um, mm. the thing I wanted to offer to everybody is they still weren't going to come, so that was that and that was that. But the first opening night of the show was a benefit for the 25 miners who had died by that point. It started in 1970 and this was 96. And so what do you have in a culture? When I was working with the police, um, the police is a partner structure, so they were partnered one-on-one -on -one with a poet, that buddy system, right? And this was um, a benefit to raise money, which they had no memorial, they had no recognition of these folks. And so, and charging instead of $20, it was $100 a ticket. And they came, and then they could talk at work about it. So then they could tell their families to come. So just figuring out what's the culture, what the opportunities, yeah. what's missing, and how can we make that work for the better of the whole. Yeah, I have a question for the group, and, and uh, yeah, get, get a mic here too, but uh, let's see if anybody wants to first respond to the question. Uh, we, we have gotten into the habit now this afternoon of, of talking about, oh, it's not that different. And it's, it's like working with ethnically uh, specific communities, or it's like working with you know, X, Y, or Z other community. And for some of the military professionals in the room, is it different? Do, when you hear that equivalency, is that scary in terms of the way we might be approaching the workers? Oh, it's not that different. We're just, it's like what we did before. Uh, you want to you say something, Bill? Yeah, good. Uh, where's the, good, and then, and yeah. I just want to make sure. <laughs> so I had this conversation with a number of people, and I, I think you're asking something that sort of uh, we've nodded heads on an individual conversation, so I thought I'd just bring it forward here. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was ensconced very much in this, our room, <laughs> the theater making room for, you know, 15, 20 years. And then the last five years, I've very much kind of left that room. And when I turn around and hear what we sound like, I, I was surprised in some ways at how it feels a little bit alien, more than I expected. And it's almost like I went back to my Iowa roots or something. And I think that's where um, it might be, it, it's, it's almost like the sound of your own voice doesn't, you're not, you don't recognize, you know, <laughs> when you hear it on a recording. Um, I think it's just, it really gets back to the same kinds of things that we were talking about earlier in terms of allowing people with very different backgrounds, belief systems, political ideologies to be um, welcomed into a conversation that needs us to be able to speak each other's language a little bit and meet in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, because it can sound a little, um, I don't know, the lack of better, uh, one thing I've heard from a military friend who's been here, a little airy. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, it's very theoretical and it's very, um, we get it and we've been like, we've been thinking and, and slugging away at these uh, intellectual concepts around performance. Um, but it really sounds foreign to somebody who's never been there. Yeah. Um, and when we're inviting them into a conversation where we say, we want to have the conversation, here's how we talk. And, you know, how, how do you, uh, how can we get you to talk like us? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, I think. Yeah. It, you have, did you get the mic? You didn't get the mic. Yeah, I, so I want to... Oh, sorry, Chris I, has it. Okay. I want to... You probably shouldn't talk about aesthetics after 5 o'clock, especially after what you just said. <laughs> um, but um, picking up on what Margaret said, um, Andrea and I and a group of people have been involved for the last five, six years in um, a group of projects that are at the intersection of art and social justice. And so in the social justice frame... Um, finally kind of getting to the point where, you know, many of the artists in that group uh, were very upset about this issue of aesthetics and how the aesthetics that they thought they were bringing to their work uh, were being thought of as, within the art community, lack of rigor, right? Um, so this notion of um, that somehow social justice arts projects uh, were needed to be thought of by a different standard instead of uh, instead of being thought of as high quality plus more. So uh, we kind of took on defining, well, what is that plus more? 
and we have, it's in press, um, worked with many of the kinds of qualities that I think people have talked about here, but I think they would need to be, def I think there are more that you would add from this conversation, and I think you would rejigger the language to frame this conversation. But some of those qualities are things like disruption, um, like risk-taking, um, like uh, what we labeled porosity, which is, you know, many different ways into a work um, instead of kind of a, a narrative um, typical way. We tried to do something that would be applicable across art forms, and we, we tried to have it not be thought of as a quality in the way you think of a standard, but qualities that you might pick up on um, as an artist and uh, articulate and, and, and want to be, uh, quote, judged and judge yourself by those qualities. So um, I just finished the, the part of this that's designed for funders, <laughs> which is uh, with funders to really have people in panel processes and looking at funding be thinking differently about the qualities, the kind of the what would you look at within the canon of that work, so you'd still have the quality that would go along with a dance form, but then you'd look at these other things too, and you'd value them um, in, you might, depending on you know what the context is, you might privilege those more. And many of those qualities are about the process of making the work, um, as well as the product. In fact, really more of them are about the process, and many of those qualities have both a process and a product element to it. So this notion of um, aesthetics, we spent a lot of time talking about whether you would use that word or not, but we decided that we did want to claim it in this context because I do think there is sort of an aesthetics that you know have, has come up many times in these conversations about what qualities should be associated with the, the work without trying to make it too standard, and mm -hmm. um, you know, it, um, it'll be interesting to see. We can talk more about tomorrow what some of those qualities uh, might be. You know, some of them are s similar to what we've packed into the social justice, but I think some of them take on a different, different flavor. Uh, uh, yeah, I've got a microphone back here. I'm going to use. Oh, good. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. Find them. Uh, that's, uh, that's right. It's good. Um, I. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to just take a little bit of a risk uh, as, a, as somebody who's been listening a lot this afternoon. And just to your question, um, uh, David, about um, this thing about um, is this like working in other communities? Is this a similar kind of thing? And um, uh, HowlRound does a lot of these convenings. So I've actually sat in a lot of these convenings. And the tenor of this feels different uh, to me. And so I've been trying to get at what the difference in the tenor is because it doesn't feel like... Um, uh, and, and not a good or bad, but just different. It doesn't feel like a Latino theater commons convening or bringing a group of black theater artists together or it actually feels different to me and I, I, I'm gonna take a risk at saying what that difference is and then probably be wrong, but just you know, trying to sort that out. Um, which is one is, as I've been thinking about the work, it feels like we're all circled around a kind of common sense of purpose in this room in terms of the ideas around the work that we've been talking about, which are works of connection around, uh, you know, these questions of reentry, these questions of civilian versus military life, um, and that, that, that e even the work that we've looked at, there's been um, aesthetic differences for sure, but thematically, I think they've been uh, at least felt to me, um, s you know, covering similar terrain, and I don't mean that in any kind of reductive way. And so what feels to me here in this room is a kind of common purpose about connection to a community that maybe we felt like we haven't been fully connected to, and that what hasn't been um, you know, mind and, and uh, is all of the differences inside of that. And so what happens in, um, uh, you know, the conversations that we've had often is that a lot of tensions arise because there isn't a sense of common purpose uh, of why we're gathered. Uh, and so um, I feel somehow this sense of common purpose is making this feel incredibly uh, coherent as a conversation, even amongst some little differences. And so I just want to put that out there, and I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing or a starting point, or does it all fall apart from here? Uh, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but that's what I just noticed having sat in a lot of these. Yeah. Yeah. 
you got one? Okay, good. And then yeah, Andrea, good. and then we'll get one over to Jeremy. Um, so a couple of things. First, uh, David, to answer, or from my perspective at least, um, for I, I was asked, I, I was actually asked this question on Sunday when we, we did an event with um, uh, the Warrior Chorus in Austin. And one of the audience members, you know, brought this idea of, well, aren't you afraid of universalizing the experience of the military? Um, and, I, and I think that in any, any situation where you are trying to build a bridge between, you know, two places, that there is that, that risk that risk of universalizing the experience that somebody maybe goes in to the audience and they watch what's happening and, you know, and then they feel as if they have, you know, they've, they've connected with and maybe absorbed some of that experience themselves. And, and that's always going to be a risk. I don't think that that's a reason not to do the work. Um, I think it's a reason to pay careful attention with how you do, how, how you do the work and, 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 you know, and, and how you're witnessing to uh, those stories. Um, so, like, just the, just this idea that you know, if you go in and you um, you, you you watch an experience that happens, um, and you know, and, and, and in theater, you know, going back to Aristotle, you know, this idea of having a, a catharsis means that in some way you you relate to the things that are happening on that stage, and it allows this purging of emotions that happens inside of you, and sometimes that that can lead a person to feel like they have experienced that, yeah. Kind of like the mirror, the idea of mirror neurons, you know, and, 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 and watching somebody lift a cup up and you in your mind, you know, your mirror neurons are firing off and they feel like they're lifting a cup, but it's your body that's controlling your action, not actually doing that. Um, in, in, I feel like in theater sometimes that, that there is the potential for universalizing the experience. Um, but when it's carefully done, you know, and, and when the proper witnessing is paid, um, that it, it, it guards against that, and it allows people to bridge that communication gap without feeling like they now own part of that experience. Um, the, and, and, and so this is a, and this is off on a different um, on a different note, but related to what was going on on the um, in, in the presenters. And thank you very much, presenters, because I've never heard this viewpoint, and I think it's such a valuable viewpoint to hear. Um, I have I have a question about. Um, just a couple of just a couple of thoughts, I guess, or a couple of questions. Is number one, um, are you working at all during things like orientations when there are already big gatherings of students, and is you know is there is there a place where that can become more a part of it? Um, number two, are you looking to bring in speakers in you know if we're doing if you do a week of engagement, um, and you you know you have the show as kind of the culmination of that week of engagement. Are you working with um, with the the military leaders of that area? So if you if you have a National Guard area, uh, National Guard troop in your area, or you have a you know reserve component there, you know they they have colonels and possibly generals that are in that area. Are they coming in to speak? That excellent. If that's if that's what's happening, that's amazing. That's really really amazing work. Because I know we have Admiral. Um, uh, uh, why am I just losing his name? What's that? Uh, no, no, Ad Admiral um, McRaven, thank you. Admiral McRaven is the, uh, is the chancellor for the UT system now. And it's something that I haven't seen happen yet with um, UT, or with uh, Texas Performing Arts that I, I think could help, is getting Admiral McRaven in, who has, amongst military populations, I mean, he's a god, you know? And I'm a liberal, I'm a hardcore progressive, but in the military, I recognize the, you know, the, the stature of Admiral McRaven and what he represented. Um, and so having someone like that come in and do you know, some kind of talk about leadership and you know, as part of it, wow, I mean, that's, that, that could be really powerful. Um, and then the last thing is every presenting organization has large shows that come in. And as those large shows come in, they have to be loaded in. And part of loading in is bringing a crew to load in. Now, a lot of times I know that the crew spots are reserved for you know, potentially the fine arts students and things like that, um, or union in some cases. Um, if there are positions that exist, um, I can tell you from experience um, that in my reserve unit back in Austin before I, before I got out, 
there were reserve soldiers there who did not have jobs. You know, they, 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 the only source of money that they really had coming in was from their reserve paycheck and whatever they could, you know, scrounge up from time to time. And so finding work like that, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it, it pro provides a service to them, but it also allows them to provide that service back to you so that they feel like they are going in and, pro and being productive and doing something, you know, for themselves as well. And so that might be a nice way to, you know, to present a bridge at that point. Great. Thank you. Andrea. Um, and then we'll get one over here. And then one over there. So uh, I, I want to just say, I find myself saying this in arts convenings a lot. I do not assume that we all have common ground. I actually don't sit here and assume that we all have common purpose or do this for the same reasons or even have the same worldview or political point of view. And I think when we do make that assumption, we forget to have some really important conversations. Um, so I'm just going to put that out there and, but, and talk about specificity and commonality for a minute. I think for me where the area of of common experience is, and Real and I were talking about this earlier in a break, is because I'm specifically focused on work around trauma, uh, which is not the entire military spectrum or military experience, but that's the work that I'm focused on is, uh, is, is trauma. There, there is literally, literally common experience, the psychosomatic thing that happens in the brain and body and in, in response to trauma is actually literally the same, whether it's trauma from co combat or sexual violation or domestic violence or uh, war in your streets in urban centers. That physiology and psychology is actually the same. All of the circumstances surrounding it are really specific and different and may um, actually compound the trauma or not, right? And um, such as uh, moral injury or um, such as um, polytrauma that happens in a combat situation that might not be the same in another situation. So I think, you know, as, as artists and in doing this work, we have to hold both of those things. We have to hold the understanding of common, the places where there is commonality and common experience, and then be really specific. Like what makes good art is specificity, right? And um, so I wanted to offer that and then put the presenter hat on for just a second and say that m in my presenter world, uh, I feel successful when I get people in a room together who would never be in a room together otherwise, and actually the art helps them have a deep and meaningful and potentially transformational conversation. So I feel successful when I'm able to present a work and have in the, in the post-show discussion, not a Q&A with the artists, but a community conversation that includes a three-star military general, uh, a disabled veteran, Muslim student leaders and the professor who runs the Center for Global Solutions and a bunch of people who just came to see a show because they like opera or dance or whatever that form is. That's when I feel like community transformation is happening and, and that my work in that presenter role is to um, have my own point of view and worldview and purpose and reason that I do this and make space for all the folks who don't have the same worldview as me to be in a room together so that something might shift. Okay. Jeremy. You know how sometimes what's a, you were going to say one thing and you just heard something? <laughs> That's the beauty of the whole structure. It is the beauty of it. But, you know, I think it, it actually kind of relates in an interesting way that I hadn't thought of before, so I was going to say, oh, you know, this problem feels familiar as a, as a public health practitioner, and I'm sure we've heard some version of the, uh, you know, the homily, people who don't know what they don't know think they know. And then if you, th if you think about the power of the arts, of, of the arts is, is actually to, you know, meaningful and useful art is to have people know something they didn't know. But you can see where this goes. They didn't know that they didn't know, and so on. So how do you break <laughs> through all that? 
<laughs> and I and I and I think what Andrea said may be part of the clue because I was going to say, well, you know, you do what we do, you know, you do what we call environmental preconditioning to kind of plant the seed, generate a little bit of curiosity that there may be something there that they want to know more about. But then at a specific level around this topic, and, and it gets to what Barton was talking about, universality. I mean, trauma is a universal part of the human experience, so is isolation and loneliness. So maybe part of this is, okay, well, you don't know about the military situation or veterans, but you sure know a lot about what's interesting about what those those folks are, and that community is challenged with. And you use that universality as the hook to curiosity. And I think there may be something there. Now, how you actually promote that out in a community, I mean, there are all kinds of tricks for that. You know, you just kind of make that part of the discourse of universality and then let people find their way to the particular. Yes, go, okay. sorry. Hey everyone, this is Megan. Um, you know, I, I guess I was feeling moved to say something around uh, starting conversations. And I think what's been really useful for me in my practice is this idea of joining conversations. You know, to sort of listen for who's doing the work, what's already happening, what are people talking about, what is needed, which is a, which is a very local, sort of immediate act and can be a national, right? We can do listening in a national scale. Um, but there's something particularly immediate about the local for me. And um, jumping off some of the things from the inner circle, you know, I also wear a hat, um, not as a presenter per se, but I run a cultural center on a, on a large university campus. And um, I'm always reminding myself, I, I wear a campus hat and I am also community, you know, like I am in community. I'm a community person, I'm involved in a lot of communities. So I have to break down those barriers around campus and community or artist and community all the time to remember we are all, all of those things. And um, like many of you who do that kind of work, probably I, you know, will get a lot of emails from people with really great projects that might be really great on my campus and think about that role of the intermediary. Like, is this something I want to run around and figure out resources and put the time in? And how am I going to decide, you know, if this is a priority for the year? And I feel like part of my job in that comes from um, listening well in the communities that I'm in to figure out, is there heat around this? Is this something we need? Is this something that's happening for us right now? Is there an urgency around this? Um, how will this contribute to what we're already doing, to what's already happening? How does this build on who we are? How does this help us get where we're going, right? So not just, um, you know, does this look cool? <laughs> but, you know, does it also fit all those other things? Because then that's the work, right, of figuring out all those connections. So if I can figure that out on the front end, um, that really helps me getting there. And um, I guess just that piece of, um, I was thinking about that, what are the skills around the intermediaries and how might we be passing that along? And I'm curious about that. Like how might we be training up people to think about that active listening skill as part of how we do this work and how do we think about that even in the gestation process of what do we want to make as artists? Great. So uh, we're a few minutes from ending and this is um, before we go into the kind of breakouts tomorrow, which will get a little bit more action oriented. I just want to find out, is there anybody who's sitting on a thing related to anything that's been said all this time that should come into the room before we break into our groups and try to solve things? Is there anything that hasn't entered you're sitting on that you're concerned about? Uh-huh, a couple of things. Okay, so let's go back here to Scott and then to Annie. I'm, I'm just curious about, you know, in terms of the audience, I mean, are you all tracking sort of, you know, symptomatology of PTSD, how it's conceptualized, the, war, the experience of the warrior, the warrior ethos? I'm, I'm coming here as a representative of, of, of Fort Hood, and, you know, I didn't really, you know, hear questions about that. I didn't hear, have, there wasn't much inquiry. It's something you already know. I don't know. Again, this, it's a stranger in a strange land phenomena for me at this point. Um, and I guess I was kind of anticipating a little bit of dialogue around sort of how do we conceptualize this patient population? I, mean, I, I didn't hear much of that. And, you know, I'm, I'm just curious, is that something that you guys already are SMEs in, or is there people that have working knowledge of that? Or is it that you're just kind of, again, I just don't know what the process includes for y'all. And, and we, didn't, we didn't get into that very much. And that might be sort of the questions that you were sort of alluding to earlier, sir. Yeah, and so um, we didn't really sort of bring it out, but I, I, I'm sitting on that. Great. And as a thing, as a thing unmined thus far, in yes. in a conversation that will go on for some time. Great, uh, Anne. So um, 
As someone running a theater company and an independent producer, I feel very torn by, in my mind, the necessity to, I kind of call it cultural archaeology, really go through an in-depth process of forming partnerships like I did with art, um, making relationships with uh, these documentary subjects um, that is truthful, respectful, friendly, um, has boundaries, but uh, not so many that the work is, is dulled. And at the same time, I feel like we live in a world creatively and culturally where it's a numbers game that's rewarded. Um, and so for me, it's a big conundrum. It's like, because you, you read all the time, like, oh, I've done 125 shows this season, and I don't know, I have and, and that's very opposite to an, an in-depth inquiry that may take, where if, if it's taking two years to develop a show or a year and a half at a minimum and to form these relationships to make sure that the social practi practice and the artistic practice are well thought out, then how do you survive in mm -hmm. a way? Like how do you then play the numbers game as well of a certain number of performances in New York every year and um, serving a certain number of artists. I feel like those things are in direct contradiction to one another and I feel stuck a little bit in the middle of being drawn to both those places simultaneously and I absolutely don't have an answer. Yeah, great. Um, so we're sitting here talking about service to veterans and military and one of the things that struck me is that I believe that ASAP Armed Services Arts Partnership is the only veteran service organization here. Uh, and my question is, in this space of arts and military and veterans, and if there are other VSOs here, please let me know and correct me. Um, but in the space, where does the veteran service organization fit in? Um, where are we in all of this? What is our sustainability here? Um, and I think, uh, I asked the same question at the AFTA conference um, three weeks ago, or a month, I can't count, but mm -hmm. I asked this question and we didn't have an answer for that. And there are a lot of organizations that I've seen kind of fizzle and pop. And so this is just a kind of lingering question and what is the sustainability of this linkage to the community, this intermediary, which is the veteran service organization. Um, there's 40,000 of us, which is too many. Um, but there's so many of us, and where do we fit into this? Mm -hmm. And is there uh, resource challenges for that 40,000? Is I mean, Strapped, right? Yeah, interesting, because we've been focusing a lot on the resource challenges on the art side, but less so on the service side. Uh, yeah, so who has, <laughs> lots of hands. So let's go to uh, Victoria. Oh, yeah, I, I wanted uh, Maureen to get a chance to, is there anything that you're hearing that, that has been dropped that you want to put back in the space before we break out? Let's go back there for one second. She's been listening and reporting this whole time. Yeah, so I'm more of a fly on the wall than a participant, so yeah. this may or may not be of interest to people, but uh, what I heard was a little bit of a, I don't know, a shying away or a, or a, or a hesitance, hesitancy to engage with the question that Carl actually tried to put on the table um, this morning around the politics of it. And, you know, I'm hearing some people say, well, this is apolitical, and, you know, we just work with the vets without any assumptions, and then I hear other people saying, Art is always political, or you know, we need to we need to make change. We need to stop this, right? Which to me is very political um, to say we need to stop this, and and you know, getting back to Andrea's idea of like, let's not assume we all have the same perspective. But what is that? What is that conversation? If if this work is about is in part about civic literacy and cultural diplomacy. Like, to what end? Is it to stop war? Is it to have better wars, less controversial wars, um, encourage more people to enlist? I, I don't know. And I think maybe related to that, but maybe separate is, um, just, I just keep wondering about the, you know, the title of this event is Art in the Service of Understanding. And uh, it leaves me with the question of understanding what and why. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, one more, and then we're, and we can bring, make it, uh, yes, go for just, just a very short one to add. I think, you know, I feel like we have seen some truly substantial, powerful performances over the last couple of days, and I, 
I know there's more. But I also want to put on the table projects that don't um, aspire to the 40 location tour or the, you know, the big theaters. And that, that you know, and, and neither are they therapeutic in the hospital either. They're somewhere in the middle. Projects that are local, that maybe don't need to tour, that need, but, but also are substantial nonetheless. And I'd like to make sure that we have that spectrum of, of art making out there too. Thanks. Yeah, and as this is a, this is the first time this particular group has gathered in this way, uh, we're not gonna cover the whole thing. So it's good to have a sense of what didn't get covered. Uh, some of what you can do uh, in your breakouts is to dig into some of these things uh, as we're, um, that we've named, or where you're feeling wasn't quite enough uh, conversation there. That'll be tomorrow. So uh, I'm gonna hand this back to Jamie, uh, who can then uh, tell us the next plan. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to do a quick just logistical rundown and then hand it off to Jane who's going to um, tell you a little bit more about these breakout groups tomorrow and give you a heads up on uh, the prompt and things that you can be 